Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm Ukrainian Canadian. Today is September 19th, 2023, and let's get to the news happening in Ukraine and the world, shall we? So one quick little update, and this is not related to the Ukrainian conflict, but I think it's still very important because this is also impacting Russia's influence. And that is the Armenian-Azerbaijan uh, conflict in uh, Azeri conflict with uh, Armenia in the Naharno-Karabakh region. This has been an ongoing conflict for the last two years between the two countries. Armenia is backed by Russia, whereas Azerbaijan is mainly backed by Turkey and other allies of Turkey. So this conflict has really weakened Russia ever since this war with Ukraine started because Russia cannot um, send as many resources as it was capable of doing prior to the Ukraine conflict, Armenia is extremely angry because this offensive that started this week was launched by Azerbaijan. They're in need of help and Russia, the peacekeepers, the Russian peacekeepers that are in the region apparently fled. They're not providing any support in peacekeeping this area. And so uh, Armenia is very likely questioning its alliance with Russia because it is a member of the CSTO, the equivalent of the NATO alliance, but this is an Eurasian alliance between Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Armenia. Uh, and so this is kind of Russia's answer to NATO in their own form. And this is good news because Russia is losing influence in the Caucasus. Again, I've mentioned to you guys that in Chechnya, uh, Kadyrov, now this is according to the Ukrainian intelligence, it's still not very clear if it's true or not. So I'm refraining with uh, to confirm this 100%, but also Kadyrov is apparently terminally ill. We'll see if that is actually the case, but if it is the case, this is uh, weakening Putin's influence and grip over this region even more, which is a very, very difficult region to control. And so we'll see how things develop. But this is only good news for Ukraine because it weakens Russia's influence, Russia's power and its ability to project its dominance um, in, in the world. Let's go back to Ukraine. And I want to talk about Orykhiv. There's been a small little change here in Ukraine's favor. The Ukraine's liberated this small little area right before Novoprokopivka. So this is one of the trenches that the Russians uh, occupied and the Ukrainians a few days ago drove out the Russian uh, soldiers from there as you can see on September 16th it was officially updated so the Ukrainians continue advancing towards Novoprokopivka and this is one of the last kind of defense before uh, the Ukrainians fully enter Novo Novoprokopivka and you can see that this where the gray area is this is where the fighting is currently ongoing uh, but this is no easy task you can see the amount of Russian regiments that are present in this sector so uh, this is still going to be a very difficult fight, perhaps a few weeks. Same thing for Verbove. The Ukrainians continue pushing towards this village. It's very important because after Verbove, there's kind of um, one and a half, kind of uh, one last line of defense, if I can say it. There is another one here, but if they can kind of get around it and attack Romanivske or, you know, the trenches that are around Romanivske, it kind of clears up the way. Uh, basically, Towards heading towards Tokmak after they go after uh, after the uh, breach through Romanivsky, but this is still a very very difficult task. The Russians have concentrated a lot of forces, and as I've mentioned, I'm not expecting any miracles. The Russians are going to do everything possible to defend this region and throw as many bodies as necessary. So that's that for the Orikhiv front. In terms of Velika Novosilka, nothing has changed for the last few weeks. You can see that everything is in green, so there's no blue colors, meaning that there haven't been any gains from the Ukrainian side as of yet. So that is one update. Another update for Velika Novosilka and Avdivka. We've already discussed that the Ukrainians have pushed towards Opitne and getting closer and closer to the strategic position uh, of basically the Donetsk airport holding this will be very important it's a strategic position to hold um, and basically this is kind of the entrance to Donetsk city so that is another great development and the last one I want to talk about is Bakhmut now there's been reports and I'll go back to my slides that um, the Ukraine forces are ramping up uh, a push to cut off Bakhmut from the north and the south. So they've noticed a buildup of uh, tank units around the area of Berkhivka, which is in the north of uh, Bakhmut. And also the same thing is occurring in Klishivka. And in Klishivka and Andrivka, as I've mentioned in my previous update, the Ukrainians have liberated these two villages. 
And so this brings the Russians to a much more precarious situation as uh, this basically after Kishivka, there's a few villages left before the Ukrainians can attack and enter Bakhmut in the south. So what do you guys think? Do you think this is a smart move uh, from Ukraine? Um, and again, I think that perhaps Bakhmut isn't as strategically important as cutting off uh, the south of Ukraine, cutting off this land bridge that Russia has, but Bakhmut has a huge significance to the Russians. Putin claimed, as they've claimed with Kherson, that it will be Russian forever, and then they lost a few months later uh, the city of Kherson. And so losing Bakhmut for Russia would be a huge morale blow. We all understand that. They've wasted now conservative numbers say that it's about 30,000 Russian soldiers were uh, killed in their Bakhmut offensive, but uh, some say that it went as high as 50 to 60,000 Russian soldiers, most of them Wagner forces that were wasted in the winter offensive in Bakhmut. So it's a huge number that the Russians basically spent just to take a city of 70,000 uh, people prior to the war. So uh, insane losses. And it's one of the main reasons why, you know, obviously the fight in Bakhmut is going to be very difficult. Uh, the Russians, as you can see, this entire area, conservative numbers mention that it's about 50,000 Russian soldiers that are defending the general Bakhmut area. So massive amount of Russian soldiers here, which is obviously why the Ukrainians are having a tougher time breaking through uh, in this area. You can see that the lines of defense that the Russians have are much further away from Bakhmut, but they still have a very high concentration of troops, of tanks, artillery, very close by. So this doesn't make the job easy for the Ukraine forces. So we'll see what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Uh, you can see that they've indicated a concentration of Ukrainian units and tanks uh, around Berkhivka. As you can see, this is the reservoir we're talking about. So uh, Berkhivka is extremely important. You can see that there is a lot of roads that lead into uh, Bakhmut, Krasnagora, and Soledar. So we'll see what happens, but um, I'm interested in hearing your opinion. Do you think uh, a big offensive from Ukraine, uh, Ukraine side is, is, is a good idea? Let me know. Now, the next slide I wanted to go over is the help that Germany has announced for Ukraine. So another huge, great military aid package uh, that's coming from Germany to Ukraine. So huge thank you to the uh, German people, to the German government. Uh, they have really, really uh, started pulling their weights in helping Ukraine against uh, Russia's illegal invasion. Unfortunately, you know, I'm going to continue saying it, but um, the help is designed to drag on this war. And as I've said, beggars can't be choosers. Ukraine is, a be is, in, is in the situation of being a beggar, and it can't choose, uh, you know, what it wants. Now, what Ukraine would want is having a very, very massive amount of weaponry being sent out to them and everything that Ukraine has been requesting uh, for them to receive it. But that's not been this, the case, right? There's always a lot of debate, a lot of talks, a lot of thinking before Ukraine receives you know, long range missiles or, or jet fighters. And it's really being dragged on. I think it's by design. And uh, just to drag on this war, to grind the Russian forces as much as possible, to limit the nuclear threat. I understand this that argument as well of why it's so slow. Not only logistically speaking, it is complicated, I understand that, but also to limit uh, the threat that Russia poses as a nuclear nation and they have not shied away from constantly threatening the world that they're going to strike uh you know the west if uh it escalates now i mean it's been escalated two thousand times but it still is uh, a possible scenario that maybe just maybe russia might use nuclear weapons so anyways still huge thank you to germany this is a military aid worth 400 million dollars you can see that ukraine is going to receive 200 mrap armored fighting vehicles. So always really important to have those. Ukraine, as we've seen, has been very successful with small little localized attacks. And they've been utilizing very lightweight vehicles like MRAPs, Humvees, to get around and flank Russian positions. Um, the style that NATO wanted Ukraine, the, the fighting style, 
that you, NATO wanted Ukraine to utilize did not work out. These massive convoys of multiple tanks, multiple Bradleys, uh, it just doesn't work out when you're fighting against a force that has literally mined every single field, is well defended. So Ukraine, by these, by using these MRAV vehicles, is going to do really uh, good, important attacks against Russian positions. 50 surface drones, and I'm not sure what type of drones we're talking about here. But drones are always important. Tens of thousands of projectiles of various calibers, always good to have. Uh, 480 AT2 missiles, demining systems, always important. Ukraine in the south is in dire need of more and more demining systems, uh, not only to advance, but also to, um, in the areas that they have liberated, to demine the fields that have been, you know, mined to hell by Russia. And winter clothes, heat, and electricity generators. This is extremely important. We're coming to winter. Uh, winter will present its challenges for Ukraine. Uh, again, because we know that Russia is expected to double down uh, on attacking the Ukrainian energy grid and also civilian infrastructure like they did last year. However, Ukraine is much better prepared against these types of attacks as they have a great dense air defense system. And that is all thanks to the West, to the United States, the Baltic countries, Australia, Canada, and many other uh, Ukrainian allies that have provided the necessary means to defend the Ukrainian sky against Russian attacks, which have been very, um, that have been axed mostly, you know, concentrated against Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, such as the electricity grid, schools, hospitals, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, the Ukraine is better equipped and uh, for for this winter to face, you know, uh, inevitably more U Russian terrorist attacks. So this uh, is very important. So this is um, the UN General Assembly that um, happened today. And Zelensky had a really great speech. I really applauded his speech because it was powerful. It was also very direct against uh, the Russian invasion. And uh, I just wanted to share with you guys part of his speech. So um, let me read out the, uh, the, the, the translation, basically. So Zelensky mentions, each decade, Russia starts a new war. Parts of Moldova and Georgia remain occupied. Russia turns Syria into ruins. And it's true. Look, in the 1990s, Russia had uh, not only the Transnistria conflict that it fueled, but also the Chechnya wars, uh, the first and the second one. Then the 2000s, it was Georgia, um, and also inevitably in the 2010s, it was also uh, Ukraine and Syria. So, you know, every decade, it seems Russia is always interested in, in you know, creating conflicts, proxy wars, to also destabilize the West. And if not Russia, the chemical weapons would have never been used there in Syria. True, when Russia came to help uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria in 2015, uh, it only strengthens, strengthened, uh, you know, the uh, Bashar al-Assad's government. And we've seen all the atrocities that have been committed since 2015. Um, then he continues in saying, Russia, Russia has almost swallowed has Belarus. Swallowed Belarus. Pretty much Belarus is a satellite country of Russia. Unfortunately, Belarus does not have its own, I uh, would say, independence and agency. Everything runs through Putin now. Lukashenko is Putin's servant. So unfortunately, Belarus can't even be considered kind of an oblast at this point of Russia. Unfortunately, I can only hope that Belarus one day be, will become independent and free of Lukashenko. And is now obviously threatening Kazakhstan as well. That is true. Uh, it even, you guys probably heard the news, Russia's even been asking uh, Kazakh people to fight at the special military operation in Ukraine. It's been trying to recruit Kazakh people and uh, Kazakhstan is definitely not happy about it. Kazakhstan is very, uh, and the president Tokayev is extremely, um, I would say anti Putin at this point, he sees that Russia is trying to exert more and more influence over Kazakhstan, and they would like to have a similar scenario um, in Kazakhstan, potentially. So you can see that Russia continues with its uh, geopolitical games, not only in Ukraine, but also in the Baltics and in Eurasia. And the goal of the present war against Ukraine is to turn our lands, our people, our lives, our resources into a weapon against 
you against you. So I really liked his speech. You guys can watch it. It's about 10 minutes, but I really liked his, uh, his speech about weaponizing. Not only, you know, we've seen Russia weaponizing this conflict through multiple ways. It's been the food weaponization, right? Blocking uh, the transportation of grains and cereals from Ukrainian ports, bombing Ukrainian ports, and just making life more difficult for countries that depend on Ukrainian grain uh, for, you know, food security. Also children, the deportation of thousands of kids away from uh, Ukrainian territories to Russia. We've seen these examples being brought up in Mariupol where kids that were orphans or kids that even had families were deported and are being uh, pretty much assimilated within Russia, being told that Ukraine is an evil country, that it's a neo-Nazi country, and Russia did uh, tremendous things to save them, and also energy, right? Attacking the energy grid of Ukraine, also utilizing gas and oil as a weapon. So uh, this really impacts not only Ukraine, but all of us. So I really enjoyed this speech. And, uh, you know, I guess you guys saw this Russian representative of the UN General Assembly seemed disinterested, was looking at this phone. You know, he can look at his phone all he wants, but very soon, I'm very con confident in that, he will be looking at a jail cell and everyone that was involved uh, in this conflict, in this brutal invasion of Ukraine, will be facing jail time, if not, you know, the Hague. So uh, that's the video for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I really appreciate your support. Um, it takes a tremendous amount of work for me to make these videos, the analysis, so I, if you guys can like my video, subscribe to my channel. If you enjoy my content, it will be very, very appreciated. And uh, that's pretty much it. Slavo Ukraini. See you guys.